Hi there. Uh, I'm Cindy Sidwell. I'm from the Utah Debate Coaches Association Director of Judges, and this is how to judge debate rounds in high school debate. And I'm so glad that you're taking the time to actually listen to this because you are most of our judges are judges who have no experience and you can do it and it's awesome and you will love the kids. All right. So first of all, thank you. Tournaments can get frantic and crazy. So if we forget, we seem frantic, thank you. Without coming to volunteer and judge, we really wouldn't be able to have the judges we need to run our tournaments. So thank you from the coaches and from the debaters. Most of our judges are judges that have little to no experience with judging. So you may be nervous, but I'm gonna walk you through how to be a fair and wonderful judge. And I promise it's not that tough to do. You just need to keep a few things in mind. And if you still have any questions, Questions, don't be afraid to talk to any coach at the tournament or talk to anyone at the ballot table, which is where they hand out ballots and where you turn your ballots in. Okay, a few basic things to keep in mind. When you walk into judge, the debaters may ask your judging experience and how you judge. Please tell them that you've never judged before, but that you're going to do your best. If debaters don't ask, I recommend you jump in and tell them this. If they are good and wise debaters, they will adjust to you and debate in a style that you are most comfortable with. They will probably debate very differently for me as a former debater and a coach than they will for you. So with me, they may have lots of, um, lots of evidence. They may go a little quicker. Um, if any of the kids are going too fast for you, you can even yell clear or please slow down um, and hopefully they will adjust to you. That's what I tell my debaters. If they don't adjust and they lose the round, it's their own fault completely. Okay. Uh, please take some notes as you listen to the debaters. They will be taking specialized notes. This is called flow or flows, which helps them to stay organized and make sure that they don't miss any arguments. You don't need to know how to flow to be a good judge, but I would highly recommend writing down the main arguments you hear and put any arguments to those arguments next to those that their opponents use to attack. So I kind of, I tell my brand new judges, maybe do the affirmative on one side of the piece of paper and the negative on the other side of the piece of paper, and then put little arrows and put the attacks next to it. That way you can see, did they attack each other's case or did they leave it unattacked completely? For me, I use two colors of pen so I can see affirmative arguments and the negative arguments. So I put it in blue and red. You of course don't need to do this, but it could be helpful. Um, and you can then see, are they attacking? Are they answering attacks? And you can put little arrows like next to all those things. All right. One of the most important things that I would say judges need to do is just to leave your opinions on the topic outside of the round. It shouldn't matter whether you are for or against this topic. It shouldn't matter even whether you have very strong feelings against the topic or for the topic. Um, this keeps it fair for our debaters because our debaters have to end up debating on both sides of every issue. And a lot of times they don't get a choice. They don't know who you are. Uh, so I would say one of the th one of the saddest things that I've seen, and I've seen this on ballots, I've had judges say it to the debaters after the round. Oh, I could never I could never uh, vote affirmative for this topic. Like the debaters didn't need to debate because you were going to vote affirmative no matter who did what, right? So we had a universal health care topic many years ago, and this was before Obamacare and everything. And it was tough just because there were a lot of judges who were against it. And some of my kids who had tons of evidence for it would go against a team with like zero evidence but because the judge agreed with the other side, the other side won. So you can see how unfair this would be. So you have to leave your opinions outside. If you feel so strongly that you really can't be a fair judge for that topic, uh, just say that you need a different ballot for other topics, all right? So just leave your opinions um, completely out of it, your knowledge completely out of it. Uh, so you can see this 
Um, let's see. So the topic for this month is about mandatory service or compulsory service. So you can see that if you don't want a draft and you don't want this compulsory service to happen, it wouldn't be fair to the affirmative debater at that point because they could never win. Okay. All right. Remember, you are not changing policy. All you're doing is basically judging how these kids debate. Are they, do they have good evidence? Are they making good arguments? Are they countering arguments from the other side? Um, and by the end, what are the, what's the argument that actually wins the round, okay? Uh, in fact, there have been times that I have voted on arguments that maybe I didn't love. I knew what to say against them. I knew how to take them down easily, but the other side didn't say anything. And those guys ended up winning on an argument that I didn't love but because the other side didn't counter it or do anything, I ended up voting on that. And that's when I know that you've kind of become this really good judge because you'll come to me at the tournament. You'll be like, oh my gosh, I hated this argument, but the other side didn't say anything uh, or have any evidence or anything. So I had to vote on it, but that's okay. That means, that means you're a good judge, right? So leave your opinions on the topic outside the round. Um, and also your own arguments. So don't bring in your own arguments or evidence. You are not debating the debaters. Our debaters are debating each other. Um, we actually have this problem a lot with former debaters, usually just out of high school. They're so in the, they're so used to debating that as the debaters are debating, they're like coming up with arguments on their own. And then on the ballot, they'll be like, uh, you lose because I thought of this argument against that argument. That's not fair to our debaters, okay? So don't bring your, in your own arguments or your own evidence. There is evidence on both sides of every issue. So you don't want to be like, well, I just read an article yesterday that totally takes that argument down. That's not fair to our debaters, okay? So you're going to leave that outside the route, all right? Um, all right. So with that, da, 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 partisanship. Uh, that's what I just talked about, which is, we're, we're at a point in the US where we're very, very divided, unfortunately, and hopefully we can unite soon again, where we can disagree with each other, but still be friends. Um, so again, if you feel strongly on an issue, uh, I need you to just listen to the debaters and vote for the one that had the best argument. All right. A lot of times debaters, when they know that you're a brand new judge, they do something that is very unfair. It's very wrong. And most debaters don't really say anything to it because they don't want to look like they're bad sports or something. So sometimes they will throw brand new arguments in those final speeches. A brand new argument should not happen in the final speech uh, or the final speeches because it's not fair to the other side um, to not have enough time to like counter that argument, right? So I'm going to go through each of the debating events you may judge and talking about all of those. Some debaters think because they have a mom or dad judge, they can throw in those new arguments and final. Just don't vote on those. I don't vote them down because of it, but I say you just wasted a minute of your time on a brand new argument and I'm just throwing that out of the round. Like I'm not going to consider that. So keep it fair. All right, getting a ballot. So this is how it works. Before the debate round begins, the ballot table or people who have the ballots, which are things that you write down, you know, how the kids did and who won or lost and all that, uh, they are going to hand those out. So be sure to check that you're not judging your own school or that you don't know any of the debaters. We don't want you judging your own school. We don't want you judging your own kid, especially. That would be very, very bad. So let them know that if you see that so that we can fix that. In the upper corner of the ballot, usually there is a room number that you're going to judge in. You're going to go to that room, call in the debaters that are listed on the ballot. If you are giving two ballot, given two ballots at a time, which are stapled together, that means that you're going to take the one that says flight A in the corner. That is the first round. You're going to bring in those debaters. You're going to fill out the ballot quickly. And then after they go, you're going to call in the next debaters and then you're going to judge them. So again, fill out the ballots as quickly as possible. If you are stuck just sitting there writing this novel on there, uh, we're all waiting for you. 
Um, and we all want to go home as soon as possible and get the, get the tournament over as quickly as possible. So fill out the ballots as you go. Don't give a winner until after those final speeches, but really I give comments to the debaters as they're speaking. Um, I'll usually just split it in half and put little comments to the speakers. And then in the end, you'll have a reason for decision, which we will, I'll talk more about. Filling out a debate ballot. Uh, you can always ask to see a sample ballot from the ballot table, but you will have one in your hand. So just kind of fill in the places that you need to fill in. You're gonna fill in your name, sign the ballot when the round is over, make sure that we can read what school you're from or something, because if we have a question on the ballot and we cannot figure out whose signature or whatever, that could be an issue. So for me, I have a terrible signature that no one can read. So I try and put like my real name there, Sidwell Skyline, um, so that they know who I am and they can come talk to me afterwards if there's an issue, if I mess something up. So make sure the debaters listed on the ballot are correct before they start debating, especially in these rounds where you have an A flight and a B flight. A lot of times debaters just wander in the room, sit down and start debating. So before they debate, I say, are you you know, who is this team? You guys are these people? Yes. You guys are these people? Yes. And if there are codes, like if there are any kind of name, make sure you say the name because kids forget codes. All right. For public uh, forum and policy debate, you can ask who is first and who are the second speakers. Just so you know who is who. Put a one by first speakers and two by the second speaker sort of off to the side so you know who is who. Make a few comments to the debaters in the comments section. Again, this doesn't need to be a novel, uh, mainly just a few critiques to help them out. Remember, give some compliments as well as critiques. I usually write quick compliment and suggestion to each debater by the end. You can do this as they use prep time. Um, you can even do this as they're speaking if you want. You just don't want to miss any arguments. That's why I usually wait till their prep time or even cross-examination time. All right. So at the end of the round, you're going to end up giving speaker points to each debater. I say do not go below 24, uh, be between 24 and 30. For me, 24 is like an F. <laughs> but you don't like some some tournaments will let you go clear down to 20, but usually never, ever below 20. But like I said, I usually stick with 24 and then 30 would be like spectacularly amazing i have nothing but good things to say no critiques for you it was stunning so i don't give a ton of 30s i don't give them out like candy uh and i give out incredibly rare amount of 24s as well that would be the kids who weren't prepared who didn't really have any evidence who didn't use all of their you know who didn't really use their speaking time who were kind of like given up in the round right so yeah, just be really careful about those speaker points. In general, my speaker points range on average between 27 and 29, all right? And you can tie speaker points. So if all of them were stunning, it was the most amazing round you've ever seen and you have no critiques for them, uh, they could get all 30s, right? But um, one thing that may happen is maybe the team that won with the best argument, uh, they weren't the very best speakers in the round. So when you give speaker points, you're giving them less speaker points, but they won. The ballot table will probably ask you, did you mean to do this? Um, only because they're doing a check, is it a low point win, right? Which means the person with the lower points wins. This is kind of rare, right? But it does happen now and again. So just know if they're asking you that, that's what that is about. Uh, in the space that says the team that won this debate is, or something like unto it, there are different kinds of ballots. You're going to put the debater's name or names, and then it will say something like with the code blank. So put the debater's code code in the second slot. Um, a lot of times for public forum, it will say like, uh, the pro won the debate or the con won the debate with the code, make sure you have the code there and uh, you know who is who. Okay, the next thing is what we're really looking for, the debaters and the coaches are looking for. Um, more than the critiques, we wanna know what argument won this round, okay? So 
it shouldn't be the best speakers win the round or like they were more convincing. That's not really an, a reason to vote for them. Um, it would be an argument that won the round or several arguments that won the round. So sometimes I would say it came down to economy versus environment. And in the end, the one team showed me that without the environment, that we all go extinct in a hundred years or something like that. And that outweighs the economy or something like that. So whatever the arguments are that you think actually win the round, that's what you should put there. And that helps you remember, like during the round, you are listening to arguments and not just voting for the best speakers. All right. So you can see that that's kind of what I wrote there. Um, yeah. All right. Please write comments throughout the round. Don't wait to fill everything out at the end. We've actually had judges who have stayed in a room for an hour <laughs> um, as they're filling out these ballots. And it shouldn't be that crazy. So usually by the end, I take... Um, I've, I've put all my comments except why someone won, and that will take me between two and five minutes to fill out just that little bit, put the winner, fill out the speaker points, and then I'm ready to go. So you can see if you're doing A flight, B flight, that, you know, get that done, pull in the other debaters and get the other one going. So the tournament runs as slow as our slowest judge for real. So please fill them out quickly, bring them back to the ballot table where they going, they're going to give you another one. If you have two rounds, you don't have to like run back to the ballot table with the one. You're going to do both and then go ahead and do that. Some of the debaters will actually ask, do you disclose? This means, do you say who actually won the round? Unless the tournament specifically does say yes, please don't tell them who won. They will see the ballots. Um, if the tournament says you can disclose and you can do that, hey, go for it, right? But only take five minutes or less to talk about it. Again, the tournament runs as slow as our slowest judge. Uh, and then they'll say, do you have any critiques for us? At this point, for the most part, I don't do critiques except on the ballot. And I'll say, hey, they're on a ballot. Good job, everybody. Um, if it's something like silver and black, that's like a national tournament. And with that, they actually provide some room for you to talk to them about the debate. Then I can give them critiques and tell me what arguments that I, I liked or didn't like. Judges are allowed to ask for evidence that is being disputed. You're not allowed to put your own arguments into it, right? So I don't ask for like their entire cases and I don't ask for all of their evidence. But if one side says, if you read this evidence, it doesn't say what they say it says, then yes, I'm going to ask for that piece of evidence if it's being disputed. Um, but I think at the last tournament, we had someone who like had the kids bring up their cases and then they judged it based on what they were looking at on the cases. And that's not what this is about. This isn't just a written thing. Um, so make sure that you're not asking for everything, but you can look at evidence. So just know that after the round. Okay, debate events you may be asked to judge. Lincoln Douglas debate, which we call LD, public forum debate, which is PF, policy debate, uh, and student congress and i'm going to go more into student congress on another day I, I believe unless i put the instructions in here we'll see lincoln douglas debate so this is a one-on-one -on -one debate where debaters tack various issues that society has to deal with debaters use evidence and values and philosophy and you know still sometimes real life and statistics and stuff to try and prove their side of the debate so this is how Sorry, this is how the round goes. Uh, you can kind of see it there. There are there is usually four minutes of prep time. The prep time, they as they're preparing, they will say, I am now going to take two minutes prep time or I'm going to let my prep time run or something like that. For me as a judge, I usually keep track of it. The varsity debaters especially keep track of everything. They keep track of each other's. They time each other. Uh, and I usually have the debaters time each other as well. Sometimes I will still set my own timer just in case a kid forgets to push start. But you can see that's how the round goes. Uh, so the affirmative presents a speech. There's a cross-examination by the negative team, by the negative debater. The negative has a constructive speech during this speech 
They will read their case, but then they will also attack the affirmative case. This is the only time the negative can come up with new attacks against the affirmative. Every once in a while, I have a novice debater who will be like, but my negative case is seven minutes long. And I'll say, well, if you don't attack the affirmative, you should be losing all your rounds because they need to attack each other's case, right? So um, the negative needs to attack at that time. Cross-examination by the affirmative for three minutes, and then the affirmative rebuttal. This is where they answer attacks and they attack the negative's case. Again, this would be the only time that they can come up with new attacks to the negative case. The negative rebuttal and summary, they kind of go over, you know, all the arguments that have happened so far. And then they may also come up with then voting issues, which is something that I ask kids to have. You're welcome to do that. Voting issues are saying, okay, debaters, not only are you throwing me your arguments, you're gonna say, I win the round today because of these following arguments that I followed through on, and here's why I, be, why I win with them. I love that. They shouldn't make me think about what the arguments you know, how they weigh out in the round. And then the affirmative summary, they're basically going over the main voting issues in the round. And then the round is over. And remember, no new arguments in those final two speeches. The negative can, of course, answer arguments to their case, right? That may have a, a somewhat new, but there shouldn't be anything else new there. Okay, public forum debate. Um, this one was specifically made for our lay judges, our judges with no experience. It was created for that purpose. This debate is a two-on-two -two event. So it's a team of two against a team of two. They will argue a topic that is ripped from the headlines. So usually very current events. As soon as you come into the room, debaters are gonna flip a coin or you can flip a coin. And then whoever wins gets to pick pro or con, or they can choose to be first or second speaker. So be sure that you write down on the ballot who is on the pro side and who is on the con side. Um, and with this, because this can get all mixed up, one thing that I do is on the ballot, it will have like, um, one team on, on the left side and one team on the right side, I will make them sit in those places so visually I know this team is that team that is sitting there and this team on the ballot is that team that is sitting over there. So I'll say, oh, okay, I need the Bingham team to sit on the left here and I need the Hillcrest team to sit over here on the right just so I know who you are. And let me just clarify, Bingham, or are you pro or con? Um, you know, I, I do that just to make sure some of our topics can get turned around where like pro is con and con is pro. And uh, so it just makes sense to so that you can see what's going on. There is two minutes of prep time per team and that is it. So they will definitely be using that very carefully. Those first speeches that you see there for four minutes, all they're doing is reading their cases. There is then a crossfire for three minutes. So unlike Lincoln Douglas, where one debater just questions the other, in crossfire, the first two speakers there will be asking each other questions, but there's no set way of like how this goes. At nationals, a lot of times they'll say the team that spoke first gets the first question, um, but they can jump in. They can say, do you mind if I have the first question or whatever. Uh, during this time period, hopefully they're both asking questions, right? And if they aren't both ask, asking and answering questions, you can write that on the ballot. If someone takes over the, the questioning time, um, and not in a rude way, but they keep asking and the other team doesn't ask anything. You may want to put on the ballot, hey, make sure you ask questions, right? If someone's being rude during cross-ex and won't let another debater speak, I also put that on the ballot and say, hey, let the other team have a question. Don't just talk over them. Don't be rude. That's not cool. All right. Um, yeah. So just make sure that you you note that on the ballot if that is going on. We're trying to teach our debaters to be perhaps passionate in cross-ex, but not to be rude about it. Okay, for the second speakers, so the first one gets up and all they do is attack the 
their opponent's case for those four minutes. They're just going to go down and attack that case. And then the next speaker gets up. They're going to attack the case and answer attacks to their own case. All right. And that's what's going on during these, those four minutes. Then they, those two have a crossfire. Uh, and then there is something called summary speech. The first speaker gets up. Usually they have to answer attacks to their own case, but then they're going to sort of clarify what's going on in the round and what are the main issues, right? Maybe what they're winning on, um, that sort of thing. I tell my kids to compare the two cases and come up with why they're winning so far. The next summary speaker then gets up and does the same thing. Some summary speakers just like go over both cases, which they're certainly welcome to do. Um, but I like my summary to be, you are starting to crystallize the round. Grand crossfire is kind of weird uh, in that all four speakers get to ask questions. This should be done sitting down. So the other crossfires, I tell them to stand up. There is no rule. Sometimes they stay sitting. I think it's respectful to the judge to stand up. Um, but, you know, it's up to you. Grand cross, they must be sitting down, though. Um, because apparently in some sort of myth that has gone on through debate, and maybe it actually did happen, I don't know, uh, in a final round, the first year public forum was a thing that someone stabbed someone in the neck with a pencil. Yeah, I don't know if it's true or not, but hey, it's, it's yeah, some good stuff to think about. So Grand Cross goes on, and then final focus um, is just about mainly those main voting issues. Uh, what's going on in the round, why they win very clearly, right? What they are winning on. And that would be both speakers are going to go about doing that. And again, no new arguments in these final speeches. So if someone brings up a new argument, like put on the ballot, because we want to teach our kids, don't do that. You know, put no new arguments in final focus. So I'm disregarding this argument. Okay, because we want to keep it fair. All right. Policy debate. Policy debate has the same topic all year. It is a two on two. They get really in depth into the topic. The affirmative usually has a plan and a case which talks about like the solvency and the harms and why we need the plan. The negative can attack that case and plan or they might do something called off case arguments. These are things like counter plans. Maybe they're questioning the topicality of the affirmative's case. Is it actually on topic or is it off topic? Does it meet it specifically? They get very, very specific. Uh, they may have some disadvantages. They may have some other interesting arguments um, that I'm not going to go into here because they real, really are in depth. And usually we don't have our brand new judges judge policy. But if you are given a policy ballot, what I would say is when you come in, just please, please tell the kids that you have never judged before that... Um, I, you would prefer if they spoke at a slower pace and really explain the arguments so that you could follow what these arguments are. Because these policy debaters do usually speak very rapidly. It's called spewing. And so if you need to judge it, just yeah, tell them to please slow down and explain the arguments. Or when I first started judging policy, I was like, I can keep up with a lot of spew, uh, but please slow down on those arguments. Let me know what they are, even if you're like reading the card or the piece of evidence really fast. Okay, so hopefully our brand new judges don't have to judge policy, but if you do, hopefully they will adjust to you. There's how the policy round goes and there are, so it goes about twice as long as the other rounds. Okay, student congress. Judging student congress is very different from judging the other debate events. In student congress, all the contestants are going to come into the room at the same time. There are usually between 20 and 30 of them or so. They're going to be speaking for and against bills they would like passed into laws. There is usually one other judge, if not two other judges in there at the same time. Now you're not to confer as to who's doing better, but you can ask you know, who just spoke or something like that. So sometimes the judges sit a little closely just so they can ask questions that way. It's very important to organize your ballots. So when a congressperson gets up to speak, you can easily find their ballot, fill out that they gave a speech. 
Now, I usually hand the actual blank ballots, the pile of ballots that you get, out to the Congress people. I have them fill out their name, their codes. I have them fill out, is it round one? What is this house called? Um, all those things. And then I gather them up and I put them in alphabetical order or I put them according to codes, like if their codes are one, two, three, and one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, five, or something like that, right? Um, all right. The students throughout this round will be debating these bills and whether they want to get them passed. The students will automatically get up and run this round. So it's kind of cool because you're just sitting there watching. You are observing and you're writing things down. Uh, the first thing that they're going to do is elect a chair, which is also called a PO or a presiding officer. This person runs the round and they choose the people to speak. Now, as a judge, you're mainly judging them on their speaking ability as well as like how much they are participating, their logic their analysis, you know, are they actually participating a lot in the round? Um, it's, it's important for you to take some notes on the ballot uh, just so you know who is who. So a lot of times I will put a little something that might stand out about them. Uh, there was this one debater or congressperson who had a cane. So I'd be like, he has the snake head cane or this kid wears a hat, the girl with the purple tights. Uh, guy with orange tie, right? So I kind of write that in the corner of the ballot to remind me later on as to who they were. Um, and at the end of the round, you're going to be ranking them first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, etc. Usually it's to 15, but talk to the people running the tournament. Nowadays, it seems like you're actually ranking them all the way to the very end. So if there are 25 people in the round, then you're ranking them to 25. If someone didn't speak, you actually don't have to really rank them unless you you know, want to. They ask some good questions. But you can put DNP or did not participate. Um, yeah. Clarify with the tournament how that happens. Uh, there was one time that a judge wanted a kid who asked some really good questions to take first in the round. That shouldn't happen. Really, you're judging them on, yes, did they participate with questions, but also they're speaking, right? Did they get up and give speeches? They all have a chance to do that, the way that they keep track of things. And if they are ever elected chair, that counts as one speech. So on the ballot, you will write down chair right? And you can say how good a job they did in, sorry, in running the house. Um, so that counts as one speech. And then every time someone gets up to speak, you can say, what's your code or what's your name? Find the ballot, pull it out, and then write a few notes. If it's a banning smoking bill, then I'll put like ban smoking and I'll put a few comments to them about what I liked about it or watch saying, watch you know, saying um too much or watch saying like, or maybe you need a little evidence behind you or something like that. Okay. So usually in general, they do get the bills ahead of time. So they have time to do a little research. So yeah. So do kind of look at that. The best speakers, the people who are running the house, the people who are asking questions. One thing I do that not all judges do is I actually get a blank piece of paper and make like a seating chart and I have the kids put their code on the seating chart. And then I put little tally marks when they ask questions. So that kind of helps me later as to how involved they were, if that helps you out. Um, there are a lot of ballots by the end. So make sure that you're filling them out as you go so that all you have to do at the very end is just rank them. All right. All right. That is it. You're going to be a great judge. Remember, don't use your own opinion or arguments in the round. Just judge what is presented to you in the arguments there. Fill out your ballots carefully, but quickly put a winner and a reason for decision on each. Be kind. Enjoy our brilliant debaters. We are really proud of them. And it's amazing when you get a varsity debater, they will surpass by far like what us as coaches can teach them because they start teaching us. They start reading philosophy books. They start, you know, doing a lot of their own research. And it's pretty cool. These are the future leaders of America. And you'll see that. Um, just a couple more things. When you're in a round, please don't play games on your phone. 
please don't be texting anyone. As a coach, if I have to judge, I'll say, uh, if any of my de debaters have an emergency, I'll wait till your prep time to then text back. But in general, like you should be paying attention to the round. You should be taking notes. If you're a former debater, like don't take your revenge out on people that uh, you went against the year before, right? Or you don't like their school and now you're gonna make their school lose. That's terrible, right? We wanna be really ethical judges and we want the best kids by the end to win. So we've actually had that stuff happen. Um, if you're a college student, some of our you know debaters are pretty good looking, but please, please do not contact them in that way. Do not ask for their phone numbers after, right? Because at that point, it looks like you are judging them based on how good looking they are, right? So please don't do that sort of thing. Be a very ethical judge. And so that at the end, you know, you can hold your head high and say, I was ethical. I did the best that I could. And you're going to be amazing. Um, good luck, everybody. Thank you very much.